wow, I finally found it. My three Wii's. Play with me. A little forward, but okay. Yes, quite. Now pick up the controller. Yes, yes, that's grand. Now review me like one of your 2010 YouTubers. Quest 64 is either a game you've never heard of, or you have a very strong opinion on, for better or for worse. Quest 64, or as it's known in PAL regions, Holy Magic Century, or as it's known in Japan, Elletale Monsters, is an action RPG developed by Imagineer and published by THQ. My brothers and I first picked up this gem during our very own quest, the blockbuster, and we were instantly drawn by its fantasy aesthetic. I mean, look at the box art. It's got everything a kid could want on it. Castle, dragon, a little boy with a stick, even a free coupon to Pizza Hut. This game was made for me, with over 50 spells, more than 100 characters, and even mild animated violence. This game was set to be the greatest RPG the Nintendo 64 had ever experienced. And it was, because in 1998, it was the only RPG on the system. Now this game is somewhat contentious among YouTubers and RPG fans alike. They either hate it or they love it, and there's no in between. And that's why today I'd like to take you guys on a journey of rediscovery as we take a look at Quest 64 and find out, was this really an insult to all RPGs and should have been kicked down a mountain, burned at the stake, and buried under a thousand copies of Mystic Quest? Or is there something redeemable about this, the first RPG on the N64? Let's go! Meet Brian! Yes, Brian. Not Vi's, not Locke, not Lloyd. Well, okay, maybe a little Lloyd, but my point I'm trying to make is that his name is Brian in North America. If I could direct your attention over to here, this chart I've made of main characters and their names in different regions, you'll see that Cloud is Cloud in North America, Cloud in PAL region, and Cloud in Japan. While Brian is Brian in North America, Aaron in the PAL regions, and Jean Jacques in Japan. Why? I don't know. Brian is a magician's apprentice who hails from Melrode, a small town in the greater country of Keltland. Our little alfalfa wizard Jean Jacques has decided to set out on an escapade to find his father Bartholomew, who himself set off on an adventure a month prior to get back the magical tome known as the Elletale Book, which is known to contain a power that exceeds human knowledge. Naturally, this book of infinite power has been locked securely below the Melroad Monastery in a dank crypt for many decades until recently it was stolen. So with the staff of power in our hand, we set off on a voyage to find our father and save the land from chaos as a kid. Something that I really appreciate about this game is that much like the name insinuates, it does feel like a quest. Brian goes from town to town, solving people's issues, absorbing power, going into forests and dungeons, all in the name to find his papa. We start our adventure off in the Melrode Monastery, and right off the bat, you might notice that the inside of this place is quite detailed. They have books, bags, and, uh, Jesus? You can tell Imagineer put a lot of love and effort into these places, and by extension, most inside areas in this game have tiny details in them, which might not be a big deal now, but it really led me to be immersed in the game world. You have all these random rooms, some containing treasures, and some containing NPCs, all of which are individually named, look unique, and have their own dialogue. How many times do you go into a game, and you walk up to an NPC, and it's just, Fearful Man! or Village Chief. Couldn't be Quest 64. Like, who the heck is Tim? I don't know, but I liked him. Even the inns, which effectively act as a save station, have an upstairs where you can go talk to Ho Ho Hubba Grubba. Nice. Among the inn NPCs, Shannon is the most helpful. She acts as Brian's guide who always seems to know where to go next. As you explore Melrode, you'll notice among the club-armed men and the children that look into your soul, there are these little bubbles placed in random spots. Now, what are these curious little objects? Well, I'm so glad you asked because these bad boys are elemental spirits. Brian can gather these spirits to power up one of his four elemental magics. You got earth, water, fire, and wind, all of which give you access to unique spells that you can cast during combat through your spell menu. You can naturally raise your elemental magic through battle, which we'll get to later, but the spirits you find across the world act as a catalyst to make your spells more powerful, so finding them is imperative to your journey and gives the player a reason to explore all that Keltland has to offer. Now, I ain't gonna tell you where to put your points, but there is a correct answer. Once Melrode is no longer of use to us and we've drained it of all of its elemental power, we step out for the first time into the big, wide, open world. World. Sorry, wait, can we hear that again? 
Yeah, all right, how about this one? Okay, no, just making sure I heard that right. So out of the discourse that surrounds Quest 64, combat is the thing that keeps getting brought up time and time again. It's either the random encounters are too frequent, the combat's boring, or my personal favorite, the camera after combat confuses me. In which to the last one I say, fair play. The camera is confusing at first, but after you finish an encounter, it always faces the direction Brian was facing before the battle begun. But I honestly think combat is misunderstood, so let me divulge a bit. I've never embraced a lover's kiss. Sorry, combat. I gotta divulge about combat. If I were to put Quest 64's combat into a category, I would say that it's an octagonal-based combat system, TM. As you traverse the many areas of the world, you will encounter monsters. When a random encounter happens, you are not sucked into a void like in Final Fantasy, but rather you are simply in combat, much like the combat system in Chrono Trigger. An octagonal arena of sorts will appear, and from there, several smaller octagonal arenas will envelop Brian and his foes. Now, you always have the option to leave the greater octagon, which will let Brian and flee the battle, but that makes you a coward. And this is the face of a killer. As far as initiative goes, whoever has the highest agility stack goes first and battle commences. Both Brian and the monsters may take their turn by moving within their circle to get closer to their target, or they could just stand there and cast a spell. If the target is close enough, a melee attack can be made, but most of the time, Brian and the enemies will be slinging spells at one another. Now, Brian does have a dodge chance that is directly tied to his agility, but depending on the spell, you could just move during the animation and manually dodge out of the way. The manual dodge mechanic in Quest 64 really creates a freedom in combat that releases the player from the typical back and forth you see in RPGs. I personally think it's super unique. Is it fully fleshed out? No. Sometimes it doesn't work because these jellies over here have 500 homing dart attacks that just turn Brian into a pincushion. And yeah, it's as bad as it looks. But positioning is key. If you're too close, your spell might miss. If you're too far away, your spell might miss. I'm looking at you, Rolling Rock. And sometimes you need to turn around so your avalanche spell can actually hit things because the boulders tend to randomly fall behind me rather than anywhere else. Eh, I didn't say it was perfect. I for one love the combat system, albeit a flawed one. Imagineer tried to give players agency and I most certainly do not think it's boring. If you stand there while hitting enemies with a stick and just trading blows, yeah, I can 100% see why people think it's boring. But if you're running around, trying to dodge, testing out different spells, it can be actually pretty engaging. And you know I gotta talk about the spells in this game. You got the four elements, earth, water, wind, fire, and each time you level up one of said elements, it gets stronger and at certain levels you have access to new spells and let me tell you, some of these animations go hard. You can tell that Imagineer really want to make something special with the spell system. My only complaint is that I really wish you could fuse elements together. Like if you had 20 fire and 20 wind, maybe a new window would pop up and it would give you access to lightning spells and whatnot. Yeah, some spells are kind of lazy. Like rock level one is just a smaller rock than rock level three, but those are just upgraded versions of the basic spell. So like, who cares, man? There's like 50 other spells. I'll also admit that the encounters being as frequent as they are do sometimes hinder the exploration aspect of the game and also yes, your A button that serves as your attack button also serves as the skip button turn. So if you click it when you're not close enough to an enemy, it skips your turn. Any other button could have been the skip turn button, but you had to choose that one, huh? But other than those minor issues, I had fun. Now leveling up on the other hand, it's kind of a different story. While I don't mind this system, I don't think it's implemented the best. Instead of your traditional gain XP and leveling up, Brian is cursed with having to train four stats separately. Well, three stats, I guess. Your HP and defense go up the more you're hit, and this is individual hits, not damage. Your MP goes up the more you cast magic, naturally, and your agility goes up the more you dodge attacks and run around in combat. So unless you're standing there and getting hit by tiny needles for two hours, you're not likely to end the game with a high HP or defense, like me. I did that. I stood there for two hours watching Dragon Ball GT get expacked by these wind slashes from these bat skulls. Hey, what can I say? Rise and grind, gamer. Combat can get messy if you're lacking healing spells or curatives, however, fret not, because there is no penalty to dying in this game. If you faint in combat, you end up at the last in you saved at. With that being said, I don't think that it's necessarily an easy game, and I think that's why people complain about it. If you don't know what you're doing, Quest 64 is actually pretty relentless. The journey alone between Melrose and Dandarin on my first playthrough was genuinely hard. I had to grind outside the gates of Melrose just to get my defense high enough so I could cross the holy fields to Dandarin. And honestly, kind of regrettably, 
I like this kind of gameplay. Quest 64 does not hold your hand, but if you come in with the knowledge on how the game works, it can genuinely create a great RPG experience. As you traverse the holy fields, fight your way through Werehairs, Hellhounds, Mr. Shine and Mr. Bright from Kirby, Brian makes his way to Dandarin, a small city run by none other than Hercule Satan himself. <laughs> Go get him, Brian. It was my best Hercule Satan voice. <laughs> Mr. Satan informs you that a thief has stolen the town's earth orb and now blocks the path to the lock. The king's men have all been but vanquished by this rogue, and now Brian has to deal with it. Oh, it's just kind of funny that every single problem that seems to pop up in Quest 64 falls on the shoulders of a literal child. Bandit in the woods? Send the kid. The entire fate of the world? A child. Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the 64th Grand Council of High Priests. Yes, today we are gathered around for yet another cataclysmic event about to happen. Now typically, we send our warriors, we send our mages in there, but I'm thinking this time, why don't we send a little boy? Quest 64 really does a good job of immersing the player into its world. Sure, most people only say one thing, but that's better than some games, and it actually shows an attempt to world building. And while we're still in town, let's go grab some supplies at the shop. Mm, okay, well, thanks for the wing. What else do you got? Oh no, is it because I don't have any gold? I've got some around here somewhere. Status? Elements? Maps? Where's the gold? Quest 64 doesn't have any. This is my one non-issue with this game. Non-issue meaning it's not really a big deal to anyone else except for me. Like how in Animal Crossing New Horizons they don't have cliffs. No one cares, I care. I love gold, treasures, art pieces, rubies, all in my RPGs. But Quest 64 doesn't have anything like that. Brian can hold indefinite amounts of items like dewdrops and giant shoes, but the only way to acquire them is to have either enemies drop them or an NPC give it to you, or you find them in chests. If you go to an item shop, the only thing the innkeeper will give you is a colored wing in which lets you return to the city in which you received it from, in which it's very important. However, throughout your journey in Keltland, there is but one item that you need, my friend. Bread. <laughs> One might say, bread is Brian. You got healing potions, but who cares when you can just stock up on some fluffy loaves? I say stock up, but you have to find them because, <laughs> you know, you can't buy them. With nothing in hand but a fistful of buns, we head into the forest where the bandit hides. It's in this forest, known as Connor Forest, that I start to appreciate the enemy design in this game. As a huge fan of Castlevania, I love games that have a lot of variety in their enemy sprites. Quest has Slippy the Toad, Catwoman, and my personal favorite, Hot Lips. Hey there, stud. Also, the difficulty spike in the forest is crazy. I went from decimating the holy fields to getting bullied by these greaser looking kobolds. Connor Forest, the questionable name given to this place, acts as the first dungeon and is home to Solvering, the Beast King. Solvering is the thief who stole the Earth Orb, and he lets us know that he will rule over all humans, and nobody's gonna stop him. Except for Brian. Brian stopped him. I feel so invigorated! This boss fight was actually really hard for me on my first playthrough, because if you get too close to him, he uses this earth shatter move in which you can't really manually dodge it, and you can't get away from him because he just moves faster than you, and lord you better have a lot of bread because this move will just chunk you down until you die. This is the stuff I love in video games, especially ones that are more difficult to get into. You are faced with a foe that is pretty damn menacing, and defeating them when you are two steps from death just feels so good. A lot of bosses in this game are like this. You have the three other mages you fight plus some others, and if you're not well prepared, they will mess you up. After your victory and saving Dandarin, we continue on and make it to the water capital of Larapool, where we meet with my most favorite NPC in this game, Gloin. Gloin's a little tired today. It's okay, bud. Me too. In Larapool, Brian finds out through the help of this Greek goddess Layla. Nice that we need to stop the demons who seem to be pouring forth from the city of wind, nor moon. And it wouldn't be a quest if we didn't have to go through a demon infested cavern, now would it? Bell Hazard is the first area where I understand someone quitting this game. It's just one long hallway filled with danger. It's also here where you kind of notice the dungeon design in this game. While dungeons are unique and I do like the environments, most of the dungeons are just linear paths with no puzzle solving, except for the final dungeon. It just mainly consists of encounters after encounters until you get to the boss which is another encounter. Just take a look at the maps provided by RPG Shrine. All the dungeons are looking quite liney, wouldn't you agree? From what I gather, which isn't a whole lot, there was supposed to be two other playable characters, Flora and Leonardo, but they got cut somewhere along the line. 
So it's my guess that because this game is in an incomplete state, the dungeons were kind of slapped together in a rush. I think thematically the dungeons had a lot of potential, but it doesn't look like they implemented anything more than just the themes. Past Call Hazard is Normoon, the city of wind. Not a lot happens here. I do love the town itself. It's got a big windmill and some wheat, and there's an NPC that looks like a love child between Heihachi and Vegeta. We found out some mercenary took Normoon's jade, and now we get to go back into another forest. Yay. We get beat up by ants and make it to Zelst. We beat him up, get the second gem, and venture back to Lorapool. Layla is happy with our success, and now she will send us to our death. I'm not kidding, you need to be prepared for this next part. Remember how I was just complaining about how the dungeons are too linear? Take that argument and throw it out the window because the ice cave is a nightmare network of tunnels that you will get lost in. The ice cave is essentially exactly what I just said. It's just a network of tunnels just filled with the worst enemies you can possibly think of and a ton of dead ends. But once we get past here, we meet with Layla's master, Epona, not the horse. Unless... Epona lets us know that the next stone is located at the bottom of the sea, and the only way to get there is to board a ship full of pirates and sail to the island of Sky. Luckily, Epona is a magical horse, or a Norse as I like to call her, and she can teleport you to the hairy pirates in which will take you to the island. Now, you might feel this too, but it's also here that I felt that Quest 64's pacing started to go rapid fire. There's no build up to the island of Sky. We get there, we meet with the second guardian of water, Colleen. Nice. There's not really much else to do here except run up this hill, fight these pencil monsters, and teleport underneath the ocean. Now one might think that going to the bottom of the ocean would be really cool. You get to see some sort of underwater coral kingdoms. But nope, you, you, you get a path that leads to a boss. I just want to fight Poseidon. You walk along this path and find Nepti, the third of the evil magicians, and she will fuck you up. Mind you, my first real playthrough, I had managed to have zero wings, zero curatives, and when I fought her, I almost soft locked myself because you can't leave the island of Sky once you get there. However, at this point during my second playthrough, I found myself just using Magical Barrier, which is a spell that grants you invincibility for three turns, and spamming Avalanche on every boss I met. Which does lead me to note that there is something to be said about playing this game optimally. Playing optimally can actually ruin any sort of challenge that comes with Quest 64, which I guess can be helpful if you're just trying to play through the game, but I recommend leveling up whatever elements you feel connected to. And water. Always do water for the love of God. After defeating Nepti and her goofy ass twirling hat, we return to Yapona, teleport back to Larapool, head into another forest. Bro, come on! You guys may have noticed, but Quest 64 follows a pretty basic story progression. Go to a town, solve the issue in a dungeon, get gem, go back to town. I really wish it had some side quests in it or something to break up the monotony. From an objective view, this could very well be why a lot of people have a sour taste in their mouth with this game. Quest 64 is a forward-facing adventure that literally does not deviate from its path, aside from that one optional area in the desert, but I forgot to record that area, so we're not going to talk about it. Anyways, we make it back to our last major town, Limland, and it turns out that there's this guy called Fargo the Firestarter who stole the Orb of Fire, who hides in the Fire Mountain, and he uses his magic to start fires. And now that's your problem to solve. Oh, I just think it's kind of funny that whenever I go to a village, I am conveniently the only one that's able to deal with the problem. Now, I'm not going to put on my tinfoil hat, but who the f is running the show? To get to Fargo, we have to head through a volcano known as the Boiling Hole. And to get there, we have to go through these ghost infested mines. It's here that we meet with another boss. Nice! Her name is Shilf. Yes, I'm not kidding, now get your head out of the gutter. She has been here for a thousand years awaiting the return of her master. But instead, she gets bonked on the head by Brian. Shilf's really not that tough. Mainly, she just shoots beam lasers and jiggles. Beating Shilf leads us to Dim Dom Drives, which I forgot to explore, but there's a hidden temple somewhere in the back that gives you lore. But more importantly, past the Drives is the Boiling Hole. <laughs> Get your head out of the gutter is a dungeon in which Fargo resides, and I really had high hopes for this place. Fire dungeons are some of the most iconic dungeons in games, but like every other area, it mainly was a line with Fargo at the end. Defeating Fargo means we have all four gems, and now it is time to find your dad. He said he was running out to get a book. That was a month ago. 
We make our way through the destroyed remains of the town of Brannock, and according to the NPCs that are around, King Bygis, or Bygis, I'm not really sure which one is correct, Bages. has gone mad with power after a wicked spirit and a mysterious woman accompanied him to his castle. Now Bygis stands to take over all of Keltland, and we have to go stop him. Hey, tell me something I don't already know. Castle Brannock is a breath of fresh air. It's not a line. Well, it is, but there's 90 degree turns, so it feels less linear. And it's filled with rose knights, which are cool. And about halfway through, you meet Guilty. And let me tell you, this was the hardest boss in the game. He was the wicked spirit that the NPCs were talking about, and he's a mix between Sephiroth and a red power ranger. The fight is really only hard because of how much damage he does, because if you're close to him, he does this, what I now call the patented Quest 64 boss AoE, which doesn't have a very good ring to it, but they all do it, or his long range claw move. Unfortunately, defeating him merely lets you proceed and it kind of feels like, why would you even put him there? At least she'll, f well, boobs. You do meet with Leonardo here, who was supposed to be a playable character, so that's nice, but he seems kind of super out of place. Past him, you meet with none other than the mysterious woman who's been the talk of the town, Shannon. <gasps> yes! Finally, some story intrigue. In a twist of fate, Shannon turned out to be, to, well, still a guide, but instead of guiding you to your destination, she guided you to your doom. Sorta. You see, Shannon's not a real person, and she can't hurt you. She's a puppet created by the demon Mammon, who hopes to have Shannon guide someone to enter his world and unleash him. Of course, your father tried to intervene once he found out that she was using Brian, but he got wrecked, son. Shannon tells Brian to save his father, he must continue, and that you don't have a choice. Really? You pass Shannon and her dad and meet with the evil King Bages. 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 Bro's rocking the Tekken Paul hairdo, which I respect, but Bages is not hard. He mainly fires lasers at you and sword slashes, but he does have one of the cooler set piece boss rooms. Defeating him, you climb to the roof where Shannon grants you the Ella Tale book. And here is where we enter into the final dungeon, Mammon's Realm. This has to be my favorite place in the game. The floating monastery is a mocking image of the place where Brian's quest began. However, instead of a peaceful place, it is a chaotic world filled with bubblegum infinity scapes, alabaster archways, bloody nebulas, and checkerboard patterns. The last of which is the scariest. Ooh! The final dungeon is dangerous and filled with tons of powerful enemies, but most interestingly of all, it actually has a puzzle, and it's not a line. To get to the end of this dungeon, you have to go through doors, but pick the wrong one, you'll appear back at the beginning. Now, this isn't the most interesting puzzle, but I just went through three forests, four caves, one of which was called the Boiling Hole, and none of them had puzzles in them, so I'll take what I can get. At the end of this dungeon, we find Shannon once again, who is having an existential crisis before sending you to what I always as a kid called the Christmas Cavern. You got the ice up there and the Christmas lights, no? Okay. This is Mammon's prison, and this is Mammon. Oh, doesn't he look like he just wants to give you a big hug? Mammon reveals that Epona was the one who sealed him away for a thousand years, and now he will be released unto the world unless Brian stops him. This fight is also my favorite boss battle in the game. The music's great, the arena's cool, and Mammon's spells emit pure raw power. And they look sick. This fight is much like the other fights in the game, except Mammon's spells are cross map, so you can't manually dodge them. Maybe the firewall and the beam, but for the most part, you'll be standing still and buffing your defense fences, using items, and dropping so many rocks on his head that when he dies, he can't even fully articulate a sentence. Am I dying? Life, I hate it. This death Peaceful. Poor guy. The game wraps up with Mammon being vanquished, Shannon deciding she'll go live among humans, the elemental spirits returning to the realm, and Gloin finally finding happiness. And with that, our quest is over. Brian and his dad go back to living a peaceful life and everything is good in the world of Quest 64. As much flack as this game gets, I truly do think it's a gem. I personally think it gets looked down on because it doesn't have a strong story, it feels kind of incomplete, and there were other RPGs and other systems that were better. But people love to bandwagon on games that they think aren't up to their golden standard. And don't get me wrong, in no way I am saying Quest 64 is perfect. I think it is a comfortably average RPG that I personally enjoyed a lot. I really appreciate the soundtrack, the NPCs, the environments, the battle mechanics, and even just the general gameplay of this game that Imagineer was trying to convey. Imagineer even had plans for a second game following two magicians known as Leon and Sophia who would have a quest of their own 100 years after Brian. There was even talk of having its own shop system with gold and unique items and armor and stuff like that. 
but none of it came to fruition. Now there was a Game Boy game release called Brian's Journey, which apparently was just a carbon copy of the N64 version just made for Game Boy. But if Imagineer had that second chance to work on their gameplay, their storytelling, and make a complete game, I genuinely think the new Quest 64 would have been an amazing RPG. Every game is subject to personal taste, and there will never be a true 10 out of 10 game. Except for Animal Crossing Wild World. You may agree with me and you may not, and that's okay, but it is hasty to say that Quest 64 is intrinsically a bad game. Is it unfinished? Yes. Is it a gleaming gem atop Mount RPG? No, but it's not really that bad, and I think it's time it starts getting the recognition it deserves. What I'm trying to say is don't yuck another person's yum. You loaf.